Right. Welcome, everybody, to our first Genman African Safaris Live of 2021. And I'm very happy to be sharing the stage again with Steve Bolnick. How are you, Steve? Hi, Kim. I'm great, thank you. How are you? I'm great. I have been looking forward to this chat since last year, so I'm very excited to be able to present it to everyone today. Well, you are actually presenting it today with your incredible bush knowledge. Um, so for those of you who don't know Steve, Steve has been in the guiding world for about 29 years, if I'm correct, and has guided in Botswana, Zimbabwe, South Africa, as well as trained other guides in all of those countries. So quite a wealth of knowledge there, Steve. And a little bit of guiding in East Africa as well. And, and uh, yeah. There you go. Um, so welcome everybody. Please let us know where you are watching from. Pop it in the comments. Pop any questions for Steve in the comments. I'm sure they're going to be many. It's a very fascinating talk today. Um, we are basing it off an incredible itinerary that we created last year with Steve and Camp Mana called Walking Wild Camp Mana and Wangi, where Steve leads you as a professional guide um, on a walking safari through the bush, where there are many tips for survival, for interest sake, in learning how to read the bush, which is what we're going to learn about today. Before we begin, I would like to ask you to like and share this chat um, to support the travel industry and to help us grow our travel network while travel's a little bit slow at the moment. So we would really appreciate all that support. And to show our appreciation, we've also created a little discount code for this walking safari, which you will need to email info at genmansafaris.com. Um, and the code is walkingwild2021, and you get to find out more about the special discount that we've created for you. Right, Steve, tracking. Today we're going to speak tracking. And you said something wonderful to me the other day. Um, we were talking about how tracking is like reading the bush. And you said there's two aspects to tracking, there's identifying and then there's following. Identifying a track is like reading a newspaper and following a track is like reading Keats, where you have to read in between the lines. So can you speak into that a little bit for me? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a line you often hear on, on safari um, guides and hosts will say, oh yeah, the trackers get up in the morning and they, they look at the, the sand and it's like, for them it's like reading the newspaper. Um, and as I suggested to you, the, the part of tracking that involves just identifying tracks is just one side. And in a way, it's the easiest because you can simply learn the shapes and sizes of the tracks, although there are a lot of tracks to learn. Mm. And, and most people never learn them all. And we always come across tracks that confuse us. But for for the most part, the tracks that we see regularly, we can just look at them and we know what they are. But if you want to follow a track or understand what the animal was doing, that involves a whole lot of interpretation. And that was the analogy with poetry. Poetry, well, certainly I find poetry not very straightforward. It takes a lot of brain power. And so tracking is the same. If, if you're going to find, try and follow an animal, um, or, or even if you're not going to follow it, if you want to try and work out what was going on, you have to start interpreting the tracks. And that is a very much more complicated process and I think only comes with a lot of experience. Can you see, can you see the, uh, the screen? Have, have I got the, the slideshow up? Are you able to see it? It's coming up now. Oh, okay. there we go. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, so just a bunch, uh, an example of some of the tracks that you'll see in the bush. And just going off what you said, you've also um, been teaching me, which I've been very lucky to be having these conversations with you, Steve, about how reading tracks is like a mystery. As, as you've just said, there's a lot of different aspects and a lot of different things that you have to take into account. And um, some new words for me are subtrait and environmental artifacts. Um, as well as being able to to read the context of the of the situation where a track uh, has been has been put, um, can you tell us what subtrait is? 
Substrate. So substrate is, is the substrate. surface. Substrate is the surface on which the track is made. And um, so in that slide you've just shown, uh, that's a muddy uh, surface, and it's left a very, very clear track of, can I tell you what it is? Or are we going to well, ask let's, see, I, let's see if anybody um, of our audience who's watching is able to tell us what it is. While well, we talk about the the substrate. <laughs> so the, the, it's left a very clear track, and um, the the part of the interpretation here is that track is not going to age very quickly. It will remain clear for a long time because the mud remains quite firm, mm -hmm. um, and, and so in that substrate, the track will retain its integrity for a long time. Whereas in soft sand the track when it's made is not that clear and deteriorates from there quite rapidly. And um, one of the nicest substrates on which to see track is on hard ground that's covered in a light film of dust or sand, like that. So mm -hmm. the one on the left, the lion track. Um, incidentally, uh, whoop, whoop, whoop. that track that you can see in the dining room mm -hmm was actually yeah. photographed here in, in, that's the dining room at Camp Mana. And there's a great yeah. story behind that. But um, that, that substrate's a great substrate. Um, and um, at the time of the track being made, at the point of it being made, it's as close to perfect as it's ever going to be. And it immediately starts deteriorating from there. And the rate of deterioration, one of the things that people are fascinated by is how can a tracker tell the age of a track? Well, mm -hmm. I need, give you a little bit of inside information that other trackers listening might get upset about is that I've been with experienced trackers before, three or four of us, and often had absolutely no agreement about the age of a track. So, um, you, you know, th there'll be certain basic agreement, but uh, sometimes there's quite a difference in, in, in what we conjecture the age is. And that's part of the reasons why, one of the reasons why I said it involves interpretation. Louis Liebenberg really, uh, if, if anyone's interested in reading more, there are quite a few books on tracking, but Louis Liebenberg wrote a couple of, of, of books. That one there, The Art of Tracking, is more th uh, theoretical, um, and, and this one is more practical. Um, but he, he talks about tracking being the origin of science because... Mm -hmm one has to put forward hypotheses. And so when you're aging a track, that's one of the times you might do that. You might say, okay, this track looks really clear, but you don't jump to conclusions. Yeah. You carry on following the track and collecting evidence while you're going. I love that idea. And I think you said it as unraveling a mystery to collect that evidence and read the context. And we're talking about not just reading the track itself, but also reading the bush and broken branches and if anything else has been disturbed around to try and put together the story of what's happened there, which which I love that idea. It's great. It's it's so much fun. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult if you tracking something potentially dangerous. It's a little difficult to explain to people with you what's going on in your head. Um, but if you just do tracking for fun and you say, okay, well, let's Let's just follow this track and see what we can find out. Um, that could be a really nice exercise. And you start putting together um, all these little bits of evidence. Yeah, I love that. Sort of sort of reading the bush and, and seeing the story as it unfolds and almost being able to see what happened there just through the track and, what, and what's left behind. So now, Steve, you did mention that this track is a lion track. <laughs> um, so you actually had Lion come through Camp Mana, which is incredible. And then this track, I don't know if anybody's written down in the audience, if anybody has guessed. Um, but now can you tell us the difference between these two? So how to identify these two different animals in the bush? Because they do look quite similar. Yeah, people often ask the dif uh, how to tell the difference between the cats and the dogs. And that track there is a spotted hyena. And the hyena is not a real dog, but its track follows the same laws of, uh, you know, or is similar to a dog track. So if you look at the heel of that track, 
you can see that there are two lobes. And if you mm -hmm. look at the front of the track, you can clearly see where the nails have registered in the mud. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, most cats, with the exception of the cheetah, their nails do not register when they walk. They retract their claws, and when they're walking, their nails mm -hmm. do not register. Um, so you can see the claws here, uh, being a dog, and then here. Over there, no, no claws registering. And the other important thing is if you look at the heel of that track, you can see there are three lobes, three distinct you can see that in both of those pictures. And um, that's, for me, everybody has their own way of identifying uh, animal tracks. That's the quickest way. If I see those three lobes, I know that I'm, I'm seeing a, a, a cat track. And sometimes the track is partly obliterated and you may just see the back of the hill. And that's sufficient to tell you at least that it's a cat. Um, if we have time, I'd love to tell you the story of that track in the dining room. Um, wow. I'd, I'd been away from camp for a few days, and I came back, and we always have an early, early sunrise meeting, and I'm always interested in knowing what's going on with the lions because the lions in our area often come through camp. And at the meeting, I asked my staff if they, they had seen the lions, and they said, haven't seen them at all. And I'd been gone for about five days, maybe longer. Um, and I said, oh, that's that's strange. And they said, nobody in the entire minor pools has seen the line. Nobody knows where they've gone to. They, <laughs> they're not around. I said, okay. And we finished the meeting. I just did a quick inspection of the camp. And um, I went down to the dining room, and there were these fresh, fresh lion tracks straight through the middle of the dining room from the night before. No, not the night before, the night before that. And then I went to one of the tents, and there was a, a clear sign that a lion had been sleeping outside the tent. So... Oh, yeah. and, I called the staff out and I said, well, well, if there are no lions around, what is all this? So they were a little bit embarrassed. So they were looking everywhere else, but right, like literally that saying right under their nose, exactly. which is not where you want to find a lion. <laughs> okay, right. So what do we have next? Can we go back to that hyena track, please? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the interesting things about tracks is almost all animals, um, quadrupeds, four-legged animals, their front foot is larger than the hind foot. And the reason for that is it carries much more weight with the head on the shoulders. Mm -hmm. But in hyenas, that difference is very obvious, so much so that people sometimes confuse the hind foot um, and, and, and think that it's the foot of a juvenile animal, whereas the front foot is the foot of a, an adult. But it's actually the feet of the same individual animal. And the reason for that is not only do hyenas carry their he heads on their front feet, they have very, very, they have the most powerful jaws of any land animal. And so they look, their, their jaws and the muscles for closing their jaws are absolutely enormous. And they also have these very powerful shoulders and necks for tearing yeah. and dragging carcasses. And so their front foot is way bigger than the hind foot. Sure, it sounds like quite a terrifying thing to follow through the bush. <laughs> right, what we were talking about the other day, Steve, which, so I used to be quite scared of walking safaris, and you've made me feel so much better because never mind just reading the bush, we spoke about reading the, the animals and the warning signs of animals, and there is a, I think there's a story that um, at Matusa Donna, which we'll get to, because uh, of some lion, as, as far as I remember, and I think these are also... Those are also lion tracks, um, and they're also made in mud. Um, another thing that differentiates, another feature that differentiates the, the, the cats in general, but especially the lions from hyenas, if you were to draw an outline uh, or, or, or just um, draw a line around the outside of that track, not outline each feature, but just draw a line, it would be quite a circular, symmetrical mm. uh line but if you did the same with hyena you would end up with a sharp point in the front and then it widens and narrows and widens again sort of like the the suite of um uh, clubs in 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 playing cards oh yes yeah um, um you were asking about matusa donna yeah so so just talking about you know um reading the bush and as well as reading the animal itself um, 
and I was saying that you made me feel a lot more safe because when you do actually come across the the animal you're tracking, if it, it's a lion or an Ellie, or um, they do warn you if if they don't want you to come any closer. Very often they do. I think one has to. I've been having a chat with a friend. One always has to be very careful in the bush. You're dealing with wild animals, and and they're just as unpredictable as human beings are. So um, you have to be a little bit cautious. Um, but yes, I was in Matusadana with a, a group of uh, visitors from England, and uh, we were walking along, and the, the ground was literally covered in lion tracks in a very open area and one of the guests started wandering off and I had asked them all to stay very close to me and, and, and right behind me. So I, I chastised them and said, please, you, you're endangering yourself um, and there's clearly lion tracks which I'd already pointed out to him and he got a little bit snotty with me and he said, oh, well, it's so open here and I've looked around and I can't see any lions and it was very, very open. It was just a sandy shore and then the grass line and a couple of logs. Um, and I said, no, please stay with me. And, and we started walking. And I, when lions want to warn you, you know, a, a lion roar can travel, some people say four kilometers, some people say more, but certainly you can hear a, a roaring lion from at least four kilometers away. But when they want to warn you and you, you're getting very close to them, they have a very low growl. And mm -hmm. if you can hear it, you're a bit too close already. Um, and so I thought I heard this growl, and um, but it was very, very indistinct. So I turned around and asked all the, the people behind me whether they'd heard it, and they said, no, you're imagining it. So I carried on, and I was oh, sure I heard it again. And I turned around and I said, did you guys hear that? And they said, no. And so we carried on two more steps, and then we heard this really loud um, growl um, of, a, of a lion getting very irate. And so we all stopped exactly where we were, out in the open still, and started looking with binoculars. And I think, I, I, I stand to be corrected, but I think we eventually saw 12 or 13 lions um, lying around us behind bushes, behind tufts of grass, behind logs. And we hadn't, not one of us had seen them uh, previously. Uh, so, so yes, um, two, story, two lessons out of that. Animals, especially lions, do tend to warn you but you have to listen very carefully. Um, well, so and, you also have to listen very carefully to your guide. That's something that, you know, people also <laughs> It actually reminds me, we had a conversation with Dr. Ian McCallum who wrote um, Ecological Intelligence. And he said about the bush, he said, assume nothing and expect anything. You know, um, anything can happen. The unpredictability of the bush is is very real and that's why you know professional guides such as yourself one must very much listen to you know with the rules of, of a walking safari and then it's a, and then it's a beautiful experience you know yeah yeah and i right. think what ian says is so true and it, it's one of the reasons why walking safari is so exciting well any safari really but more so walking safari because it's always different every single day you go out you can mm. walk the same routes and something different will happen. And then when you learn how to read the bush, then you can start picking up a lot more than you would have before. You know, what happened here, um, learning about the trees, what kind of trees on the different types of soil and the different animals that attracts and all that sort of thing. But that's a whole nother chat. We'll have to do another episode on that one. Um, Steve, elephants. You, you gave us a beautiful quote. You said, the beauty of animal tracks is often overlooked. For me, the fresh track of an elephant in fine dust is one of the most beautiful things in the bush. Well, maybe I'm a bit weird, but if you look at that picture on the right-hand side, don't you think that's exquisite? Um, that's, that, that's a fresh track, elephant track, in, in perfect, perfect um, substrate, and it's, it's showing all the delicate patterns underneath. So you can see a few things there if you want to move away from the – um, aesthetic appreciation. Uh, first of all, all elephant, um, the soles of all elephants' feet are different. And in older elephants, you'll sometimes see where they've worn, so, sort of like if you keep your hiking boots for too many years and they start getting smooth, you'll sometimes see along the side of the back of the foot, uh, those cracks have disappeared and they're quite smooth. 
The other very important thing about that track is for most animals, the feet are asymmetrical. They've got toes or a pointy bit in the front. Um, and so you assume the animal's not walking backwards when you see the track and you can tell the direction of travel. But elephant feet, the front feet and the hind feet are different shape. The front foot is round and the hind foot is oval, um, but they are both symmetrical. And it makes it a little bit more difficult to tell direction, but there is a little hint that the elephants leave for you. That hind foot is a little bit lazy. So when they lift it, the, the toes in the front dig into the sand ever so slightly. And as they lift it, they push sand forward to create uh, what's generally known as a scuff mark. And if you look at that track on the right-hand side, going off to the right, uh, you can see the, the sand that's been scuffed forwards. And that's the direction of travel. So not only are okay. elephant tracks beautiful, they, they tell a story. Yeah, I love that. And when you know, when you learn a little bit more about elephant corridors and stuff, each footprint is is becomes quite something of because the the bigger picture of the, how far elephants actually travel is is incredible. And these ancient migratory routes just sort of blow your mind. Um, when you yeah. when you do a lot of walking in the bush, you learn very quickly that the quickest way from point A to B is not a straight line. It's an elephant path. And oh, really? sometimes, yeah, sometimes it doesn't go straight at all. Sometimes you think this doesn't make sense at all. It's looping back on itself. But there's a reason. There might be a ravine in the way or a hill or or, or, or something like that. And and, the, and over eons, the elephants have found the, the easiest, quickest route. And I trust those routes implicitly. They know they know the bush so well. It's like an age-old wisdom here. Yeah. Um, right. Don't say what the next one is. <laughs> Let's see if our audience. Oh, that's a, that's actually an elephant one. But you sent me this picture. Um, yes, I love that picture. Now, with the leaves on top of it, and and you know, slightly less patterns in the in the print itself. This is an older track, I assume, or shall I not? Oh. Assume? No, it's not. Don't assume. Have a look at it carefully. If you see, um, sort of towards the lower part of the of the picture, from the middle coming towards the bottom of the picture, you can see some very very clear um, ridges there. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's super fresh, but um, this the soil looks to me, the substrate looks to me like there's some really nice clear substrate and then a little bit more gravelly substrate and I think that that's quite a fresh uh, track but what what's interesting is the leaf lying in the middle of the track and on the edge of the track and if we were there we could question whether those leaves had fallen spontaneously from a tree above the track or whether in fact maybe the elephants had been feeding on that tree and that might help us to age the track a little bit. We can have a look at how quickly those leaves dry um, and, and test how much moisture is in the leaves. And that would give us an idea. It's not a precise uh, measurement. Yeah. So bringing in the environment, it, um, I love that. And can you tell the gender? In, in a lot of tracks you can because in general males and females are different sizes. So for instance, a fully grown male lion track, if you measure it across the widest section, is between about nine and a half to 10 centimeters, um, whereas a, a lioness would probably only be about eight centimeters across. Um, but then when you get to the hyenas, the females are larger than the males. Um, so again, tracking involve, is multidisciplinary. Not only are you investigating and coming up with hypotheses and testing them, but you, it helps so much to have a knowledge of a the biology of, of of the animal that you're tracking as well as the environment in which you are so local knowledge is so useful um, yeah. because if you're following an animal and you know the geography of the area then you can make predictions about where the animal is going which can and be in terms of local knowledge you know people growing up in the area and growing up in the bush um, you said to me that some of the best trackers are the trackers that can think like an animal. They put themselves in the mind of the animal, um, and that animal would know the environment. Um, 
Absolutely. So, yeah. then that's the combination of the understanding the biology of the animal, what time of day it's active, where it's going. Um, look, well, I'll stop there because I see you've put a slide up. Sorry, I actually, I don't know which ones are next. <laughs> so it's a bit of a surprise to me as well. Um, this this one is, you, you, you were teaching us about how if a track gets um, disturbed, that you may think it's in another another one. And that's why I said earlier, perhaps I shouldn't assume, assume because um, you shouldn't really assume in the bush. You have to go back to the hypothesis, your hypotheses. So can you explain? And I don't know if anyone in the audience has any idea what this track is um, and which one is the dis disturbed one. Can you speak us through that, Steve? Yeah, I can without, um, without giving giving it away. Um, there, there are two prints on the right-hand side and uh, on, on the left-hand side, you can see um, six or seven impressions. In fact, it's the exact same print. I just wanted to illustrate a point and we spoke a little bit about artifacts. One has to be so careful not to jump to conclusions. So if you look at a book and th this came out of a book and it's a drawing, an animal track in the bush never looks like that. Absolutely never looks as clear as that. Um, a book is really helpful to give you an idea of what tracks look like. But the tracks are influenced by the substrate, the weather, um, all sorts of things. The time of fact, day. The time of day, they look very different at different times of day. So in fact, the, the track that you see made up of six prints is an ant bear, an art fark. Um, an animal that not many people ever see. And the track on the right-hand side is exactly the same track. I've just removed some of the prints. Mm. And that's not entirely possible if you are in the bush. Um, another animal could have come by, um, maybe only two toes registered in the sand and there was grass next to it. And so often I've seen people jump to conclusions and see a portion of a track and say, oh, mm. I know what that is. And that's why it's important to come up with a hypothesis. And you may look at that track on the right and say, oh, it's an antelope of sorts. Perhaps mm. it's um, a clip springer. It's very broad, although clip springer track is, is much shorter than a, an artwork. I'm just making a, 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 a comparison. And then yeah. if you carry on following it and you start saying, would I find a clip springer in this habitat? No, mm. I wouldn't. Um, and then you carry on and you go, oh, but wait, there's there's some other toes that are registering here. I have mm -hmm. to revisit my hypothesis. It's definitely not an antelope. And um, I just put the slide in to show you how just adjusting the print slightly, um, and this is a drawn print. You can imagine how much more obvious the changes would be in the sand or how much more difficult it would be in the sand. Mm. Because also you don't want to miss out on tracking an aardvark because you go, oh, well, that's that's an antelope. Let's let's look somewhere else. You have to take into account everything else in order to to know what you, you're looking for. And, and you could find uh, something really quite magical. Yeah. And then obviously, yeah, that's that's true as well. And you mentioned time of day. Um, so if you're going to go out and do some tracking, um, Bear in mind that early morning and late afternoon are the best times to see tracks. It's much easier because the sun casts a shadow on the ridges of the tracks. And at the, in the heat of the day when the sun is overhead, uh, it's very difficult to track. And if you're tracking an animal from early in the morning, you'll find that as the day, as the sun gets higher, the tracking is much more strenuous and more difficult. And just a little hint, if you are tracking, um, especially in the early morning and late afternoon, and you're having difficulty trying to see the track, always put the track between yourself and the sun. So you're looking into the sun. It's a little bit counterintuitive. People always want the sun behind them because they're not then staring into the sun. But you'll find that if you look towards the sun, with the track between you and the sun, it's much, much, much clearer. Mm -hmm. Now this, this track um, on the screen, um, if again, anyone in the audience would like to guess what it is before before Steve reveals this. I mean, there's a little bit of a shadow at the top there. If that's the top, it must be. Um, yeah. 
maybe it's the bottom. Well, you there, yeah, the heel <laughs> is along along the ridge. Okay, so this this Sorry. is going in which direction, Steve? Well, I'm I'm, I'm assuming everyone's screen looks the same as mine, but it's going from top left to bottom right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and as I said earlier on, tracks are never or, or seldom perfectly symmetrical, except in, in elephants. Um, and so this has a, a pointy part and a wide bit. And most antelope, uh, it is an antelope. The, the pointy bit is the front. So the animal's moving from top left to bottom right. And the scale of this, I mean, you spoke about scale in terms of um, figuring out gender. Um, so, so it's difficult in a photograph because there's no reference there to tell the size. Um, yeah. And there are many antelope tracks that look quite similar, but they differ based upon their size. And um, I can see some some somebody suggested Dacre without knowing the size that's not an unreasonable um that's not an unreasonable suggestion but in fact that's a, an impala track that very very pointy in the front and the it it, it looks like the head of a spear of an assegai mm -hmm. and obviously pointing in the direction of, of movement so is that your your indication for an impala you, you go for if it looks like a spear? Because it must be hard with antelope because there must be a lot of similar looking so tracks. So size, size, size is a very good indicator. And, and if you have a good eye and you can develop that eye, that's why local knowledge is so good. If you work in, a, in an area for a long time, you know what animals are there. And, and if you saw this track and you weren't sure what it was and you followed it, you could look and try and see where the animal was feeding, you'd look for its dung. Um, but also the, the, the ratio of the width of the back of the track to the length of the track tells you a lot. You could, you could distinguish quite a few antelope just based on that. Okay. Um, so for instance, a, a kudu track, we don't have a picture of one, a kudu track is very, very long. Um, and 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 much smaller than you would think, much narrower than you would expect. Um, okay. There we go. Okay, so that's the antelope. I think this one um, we chose to show a different substrate. <laughs> and now you, that I'm learning a little bit, um, this track would stick around for a bit longer because of of the the muddy nature of of the sand. And again, if, if people would like to, to make a guess of, of this, um, from, from what we were talking about before, that there was a differentiation between cats and dogs. Um, if you, anyone like, would like to make a guess whether this is a cat or a dog. But um, Steve, do you have anything to say about this track? Yeah, you're right about the substrate. Um, it's not as muddy as the previous substrate. And what's happened here is the soil has been wet and then started drying again. So it's formed a crust on the top. You can see the cracks uh, mm -hmm. where, the, where the pressure has been placed there, and it's almost as if the animal's fallen through the support of the, like if you imagine that's a ceiling and it's, it's sort of fallen through until it's reached um, the point that the, the soil compresses at. Um, and so that track will retain its integrity for a long time. And if you come across that track, you might get super excited and go, oh, wow, I can see quite a lot of definition here. Um, and so I, yeah, it could be a day old or, or more because that sand is going to... It's gonna holding, it, holding yeah. the, the shape. So in, so in dry sand, what actually happens, I said earlier on when a track is made, at the moment it's made in the right substrate, it's as close as perfect, as a, to perfect as it ever will be. But between every sand grain and its neighbours, is a pocket of air and as the day warms up that pocket of air expands mm -hmm. and it's not moving the sand grains and so that and of course if it's windy that will also help to move the sand grains and so yeah. the track starts losing its integrity from the moment it's made whereas this track here because the the sand is all compacted and compressed will hold its longer. shape for a lot longer 
It's amazing. I mean, the tiniest, I mean, just as you say, the heat of the day changes the shape of the track. So you do really have to know what you're looking at. Hey, can yeah, you... We've got, we got some great guesses going here and they're pretty accurate. Um, oh, are they? Jack, what are they Jack, Jack and Richard, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a painted dog, wild dog. Which you would be very excited to find in the bush. Hey, you'd be like, oh my goodness, let's keep going. And you can see the nails over there if you look very carefully. Sometimes it's difficult and you won't see every single nail. If you look at a drawing of a track, obviously you'll see every single nail. And then you get out into the bush and you might only, some, depending on, on how worn the nails are or what substrate the animal's on, you might only see one or two nails. But you have to keep your eye peeled for, the, for any indicators. I feel excited even identifying it on a picture. I can't wait to be able to do it in the bush. So um, this track, again, it's, a, it's an animal that makes and uses the same paths over and over again. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if anybody knows what this track is and where it's off to. Um, and when we were looking at this track, Steve was trying to find some pictures of the animal's dung to just to to demonstrate how how seeing the dung as well helps you identify the track and the animal and going back to the biology and collecting the evidence for your hypothesis um do you have anything to say about this one steve well quite uh, yeah we could say a lot the, the mm -hmm. on the left hand side is a print um of a foot it's a footprint uh, on the right hand picture is the pathway that the animal uses regularly and it's very distinct, the pathway. If you see a pathway like that, it tells you, ah, good one, Paul, thank you. Paul got it there. Um, um, so that's a hippopotamus, and hippos normally spend most of the day in the water, and they come out and feed at night. And um, because they walk in a sort of a waddling way, they lay these very distinctive paths that looked like a railway line. Um, whereas when an elephant le um, walks, its left and right feet overlap. So it leaves a single, a single mm. depression. Whereas you can see over there, the hippo has left two distinct uh, uh, paths for the right feet and another path for the left foot. Um, mm. And, and why I wanted to find the dung is if you were following this and you weren't sure, which you should be, it's a very easy one, um, you would so find... It's a unique track, hey. Sorry? It's, it's such a unique track. It's a unique track, and even the, the trail that it leaves is, is very, very unique and characteristic. But when, when they um, defecate, they leave, they spray their dung. And so... Distinct pile of dung, you might find dung sort of up to your waist height or even higher up a tree. Um, and then, of course, you know that's hippopotamus. But we spoke earlier on about artifacts, and um, uh, a rhinoceros has three toes, and superficially, it, it, its track is similar to a hippopotamus, but hippopotamus has four track, four toes. You can see the four toes in that print. But again, if you were only to see the back of that track, the angle of the toes is slightly different, but in, 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 in the wrong sand or in a difficult track, if you glanced at it, you might think that you're seeing the track of a rhinoceros. Yeah, yeah. And that's not important to carry on following and see any other evidence like dung or a trail like that one we see on the right-hand side. And then the dung would be very indicative there because the rhino doesn't um, scatter. Right. No, yes. and then remember also that white rhino and black rhino have completely different diet. So white rhino is a grazer, eats grass, and a black rhino is a browser, eats leaves and branches. And you can see that in their dung. So mm -hmm. if you know that you're following a rhino but you don't know which it is, it is, it is difficult to tell the difference. There are some people who can, I don't know if I'm amongst them, glance at a rhino track and go, oh, white rhino, right. black rhino. Yeah. But they are different. Um, the sizes are different. And um, they, they have a groove at the back of the heel, which is longer in, in one of them than in the other. But um, if you look at the dung, 
if you follow them long enough, you're going to find some dung. We're going to have to have a whole other conversation about dung. Exactly. <laughs> There's so much information in that alone, it, it, it seems. I have a quick question. Um, why do hippos scatter their, their dung like that? Is it territorial? Is it, is it simply territorial? It's supposedly territorial. I find I, I debate it myself often, and there, a lot of people have different answers for so many questions in the bush. But it does seem to be territorial. Mm -hmm. But I find that strange because hippos hold their territories mostly in the water. When they're out of the water at night feeding, mm -hmm. they're not territorial. So it might just be more an, an advert about gender or it might be a, an advert that, that is a territory, but it's not going to be defended. Mm -hmm. So I think the jury's still out on that one. I think about it often, um, and I, I, I've never actually found an answer. Well, if there are any other guides watching, if you have a, an idea, please let us know. So I think this is we've come to our last slide, and uh, just through what you taught us from the first couple of slides and how to identify which is which, um, if anybody knows what the, the, the track on the left is and what the track on the right is, if you can pop that in the commentary. Um, and, and now we can see also very different substrate that these have been um, put in, I, I guess you say. And the one on the, the one on the right is not as clear as the one on the left, uh, with the sand being a little bit harder. Am I, am I saying the right thing, Steve? You are, but also the track on the on the right. Um, it looks to me like when that track was made, the soil was a, a little bit slippery, a little bit wet. Not very wet. The animal hasn't slipped. Um, it might have just skidded ever so slightly. So there's certain important features that are are not visible, but there are others that are visible. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll I'll leave that with everybody to okay, ponder. So I'm going to come out of the slideshow now. Come, ah, there we go. That was amazing. It was it, it, just the most fascinating thing. We were supposed to stick to half an hour, but I knew there was just no way because there's so much to talk about. It's really amazing. Yeah. Um, so we're really looking forward to to joining you on an actual walking safari, Steve. I, I would like to perhaps be one of the first to book. I'm going to use that discount code. Walking Wild 2021, um, hopefully later this year. And and the picture behind you is Camp Mana itself, that, yeah? That, that's Camp Mana, yeah, that's home. I'm missing it right now. Where the, where the lions walk between the dinner tables and sleep outside the tents. What an amazing thing. Um, so if anybody is interested in, in doing a walking safari with Steve, we do have an incredible itinerary. It begins in Mana, and then we actually he goes with you to Wangi National Park as well. And the two environments are so different um, and um, very much worth learning about both. They, they hold very different characteristics and maybe the same animals, but very different characters. Also, some animals that are found in Wangi are not found in Mana. Um, oh, so, really? So I ha yeah, oh. I haven't been to Mana once, so I don't know it too well. Yeah, it's like a wonderful. Well, it's quite one of the peculiarities of Mana is we don't have any black-backed jackal and we don't have any uh, giraffe. Um, and um, yeah. and roan, I know there were sable there. I've never seen them. Um, but I don't think we have roan. But I, I see some people are asking about the previous slide. Are we going to leave everyone hanging or can we put them out? I, I need to. Oh, no, there we go. Sorry, well, I can, I can just talk to it. You don't have to put it up. But I... Here we are. Okay, so the one on the left is a lion. Um, and the one on the right, if you look very carefully, you can see the nail. I can see one, two, I can see three nails clearly. And a fourth one I can make out as well. And it doesn't have three lobes in the back of the heel. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a hyena, but it's slightly smudged. That's, I mentioned a few times, artifacts. So, um, you cannot see the two lobes very carefully, but you can definitely see there aren't three lobes in the back. So um, I, I like that because it shows that learning tracking out of a book is 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 good, but it, it's no substitute for going into the bush and getting frustrated. 
Well, hopefully we can all join you in the bush soon, maybe even with our books. Right, Steve, thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping to do another chat with you. There's so much to learn about the bush and until we can be get back to it, it's just really lovely to talk about it and explore it with you virtually, at least. Um, for those who've been watching, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Please email info genmansafaris.com to learn about more with your discount code, as well as sharing and liking this talk so other people can also learn from the wonderful Steve Bolnick. <laughs> thank you so much, Kim. Thanks, guys. <laughs>